So if there's anything I've learned over the past two weeks, it's that um, we should trust nothing and verify everything. So that's why I think we need to talk about Tether. I came across this thread um, this morning from Patrick McKenzie. Uh, so Patrick uh, is someone I respect a lot. Uh, he used to write uh, a lot on Hacker News. He works at Stripe right now. Um, so he's outside of crypto, but he has a really interesting thread about Tether uh, and what Tether has said after the whole Alameda FTX situation. And kind of like what got me really curious was uh, when he posted a link to the odd last interview that SBF did with Matt Levine. Um, and I think a lot of us are focusing now on that famous interview because of the yield farming parts of it, where he talks about how you know DeFi is a Ponzi, a Ponzi scheme. But Patrick um, actually is more interested in the section where uh, SBF talks about um, Tether and specifically how their creation redemption process worked. So uh, I had a chance to re-listen to this, and um, I'm going to play it for you uh, and add my live commentary um, and explain why I think this is quite concerning um, and what uh, it might mean. So here's the interview that Patrick referenced in his tweet. Uh, this is one that SBF did with Matt Levine last August. So this wasn't the famous one where he basically says that DeFi was a Ponzi scheme. Um, instead, in this one, um, he talks about Tether's creation redemption mechanism because apparently Alameda is a big market maker for them and FTX was one of the main channels that people um, kind of onboarded onto Tether uh, by sending the fiat currency or you know in Asia onto FTX and then converting that into, into Tether. So let's have a listen and I'll try to give you my live reaction along the way. And the first question they always ask is about Tether. And we talked about this and uh, you're a, uh, you as a, um, I guess on the exchange, but also with your trading, you're a Tether user. And you talked a little bit about some of the advantages of it last time, but can you talk a little bit further about the full experience of interacting with Tether? Because people, you know, like people have all kinds of conspiracies, like, oh, the money's not there. You never actually, no one has ever actually sold their Tether and gotten US dollars back, so forth. Can you just talk a little bit about your experience, I guess, as a Tether user and customer of what happens when you use Tether, when you want to redeem Tether, et cetera, and you, how that works uh, as a uh, actual Tether customer in size? Totally. I'm actually a little bit curious before I jump in. It's like, what, like, like Matt, having, like, I'm sure this is something that you've like seen a lot of people chattering about. Like, what's your takeaway from what the chatter is like? And also what sort of like your kind of like summary or like thoughts are on that, you know, based on that. And then I can sort of dive into what, what our experience is, has been like. Okay. First red flag. Um, Matt Levine is asking him to explain how he, they interact with Tether as a large uh, you know, part, market participant. It's a factual question. SPF flips that question onto Matt and is basically asking, what are you looking to learn? You know, so this is a tactic that, um, that, that I think you're taught to do if you're trying to give the answer that the person is looking for. So, uh, you know, I would say this is not the, the kind of response that I would give if I'm just trying to answer the question. Um, so uh, that's, that's the first red flag. It may not be indicative of anything, but um, I noticed that. So let's, let's, let's see what his real answer actually is. Uh, I want to be careful here. Um, <laughs> like, Tether is has a strange public relations strategy, I guess. I mean, like they talk a lot about wanting to get an audit and then don't get an audit. They talk a lot about their like high quality commercial paper holdings, but don't disclose them because counterparty confidentiality is very important to them, which is not true of any other holder of commercial paper in the world. Um, like you can just look at like the, the complete holdings by QSIP of every money market fund 
but for Tether, it's very important that they keep it secret. So if they were doing something shady, they'd sound like what they sound like, which doesn't prove that they're doing something shady, but it is like, it is confidence undermining, I think. So, so Matt has a really good point here, which is that, um, you know, if you're a bank and you lend your, your assets out to uh, make earn yield for your depositors, it's actually in your interest to be extremely transparent about who you're lending to. Uh, because, you know, if you do, then the market will see that you uh, have confidence in your solvency um, and it minimizes the risk that everyone's going to flood you and try to take all their money away at the same time, which is called a bank run. So uh, the fact that Tether is not being transparent about what their balance sheet looks like um, is the opposite of what you would expect um, a solvent institution to do. Yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable way of putting it. I think like a pretty pretty odd public relations strategy is is not an unfair characterization. Oh, um, and I, I think I'm generally sort of like often sort of thought of as as a tether apologist or or something. It's maybe how some people would would yeah. phrase it. Um, I certainly mm. wouldn't necessarily want to say that they've like historically always chosen the best. PR strategy or, or anything that sounds vaguely like that. So uh, just to point out, I would say one of the best PR strategies you can have um, is to have a, uh, a Sequoia-backed um, billionaire, uh, you know, basically be seen as an apologist for you uh, in the American media. You know, I think it's sort of a case where there's a lot of smoke, but, but I don't think there's really much fire. But, but I like get like there is smoke and like, I, you know, and, and I think that's sort of like what's what's going on. Well, for one thing, sort of like curious PR strategy, but putting that that aside for a second, like, you know, how about creating redeeming tether? Like, can, can you do it? You, you can do it. We have done. We've done billions. It's a messy process. Like it, it works, but it, it's, you, you know, you sort of look at creating redeeming USDC and it's like, all right, like. They have their U.S. dollars in a U.S. bank account, which is the same bank that everyone else in crypto uses. It takes like thirty seconds to, you know, transfer. Even like go create it. Yeah, thirty seconds later, they're they're sending you the tokens. You can redeem it. Thirty seconds later, like you see the funds in your account. No fees. A very very kind of like straightforward, smooth process. And I think you look at Tether, and it's like, well, it's a messy process. And I think like every piece of mess in the process like makes it much harder for them to have what would look like a self-evidently reasonable process. Like it just sort of like, you know, makes it sort of like really heightens the sense of like something weird going on. I think that that sort of like is the answer though, is that like it is messy, but, but like the, like the funds are there. Like we see like real legitimate inflows into Tether. Okay. Um, Let's parse uh, what SBF just said. So, he basically said three things. The first is that they process billions worth of Tether. So they've used this creation redemption mechanism that Tether has billions of times or for billions of dollars. Number two, he says that um, the USCC experience, uh, the one that's backed by Coinbase and Circle, uh, that process is actually really smooth. It's a 30 second process where you basically just send money, you know it's going to a U.S. bank account, and you get your USCC within 30 seconds. He does not go into detail on the Tether process, the one that he's used for billions of dollars. Instead, he characterizes it, he characterizes it as messy and complex, but he, sh- he thinks that the complexity is how he knows the funds are there. That sounds like horseshit. Okay, so uh, um, he still has not answered the question of how Tether's creation redemption process actually works. Instead, here's how he defends um, the, the, the Tether's essentially apparent solvency. Let's have a listen. From a lot of places, like massive ones, that you know then lead to market makers selling and, and creating. 
and sending, you know, real billions of dollars to Tether's bank account, you know, to, to create it and like, you know, have, have relationships with like Tether and the banks and, and everything else involved. And like everything sort of checks out in a, in a messy way. And then you can sort of get to the question of like, all right, well, what's their business model? It's probably getting yield on the dollars. How are they doing that? I don't know. You know, like some commercial paper like stuff. Okay. Um, before we move on to the commercial paper stuff, which I think it deserves its own discussion, let's talk about the defense that SBF just gave of Tether, which is that um, they're seeing billions of dollars of inflows and outflows into Tether. So lots of billions of you know, funds every day are kind of moving into Tether uh, and lots of funds are moving out of Tether into dollars. And so, he, so according to him, this is what proves that the Tether Tether solvent because the system is 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 working and is liquid every day. However, uh, that does not defend Tether. And let me show you why. Liquidity is not the same as solvency. Even though there's lots of money moving in and out of Tether every day, during the period where where the SPF is talking about, the net inflows were massively into Tether. You can see this if you look at Tether's market capitalization chart. So here is a market cap of Tether from inception to where it is right now. From the period in, let's say, I call it 2019, starting 2019, up all the way until the end of 2021, there was massive net inflows into Tether. What this means is that if there was a hole on the balance sheet, um, you would not be able to see it because the inflows would paper up any outflows. The only time that a hole would actually be visible and you know, get out there in the market is if you have net redemptions, which is what started happening uh, at, at the end of 2020, 2021. So, um, what the defense that SPS is giving to Tether, which is all around kind of liquidity, does not answer the question, is Tether solvent? So let's go back to the interview and listen to SBF describe what he thinks Tether's balance sheet looks like. Okay, and I want you to pay close attention to the types of investments uh, that he describes as being the non-cash part. So what kind of commercial paper are they investing into? So you get to the question of like, all right, well, what's their business model? It's probably getting yield on the dollars. How are they doing that? I don't know, you know, like some commercial paper like stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's like one of these things where like, if you want to try and argue about whether Tether is worth like 99 cents or like a, a dollar and a penny, I think that's like a pretty reasonable argument. And like, I don't, I don't want to take a strong stance on that. Like, I, I, I certainly don't want to like, strongly argue against any any stance there but but i think that like when the argument gets to like is it worth like about a dollar or like about 30 cents like i think the answer is about a dollar and like it, you know the reason is that it is fundamentally like basically backed by like you know about the right number probably a little bit more than the right number of like kind of dollar like assets just in like a system which is like a little bit messy in, in every possible place so they might stretch for yield but like by buying like slightly dicier commercial paper where they might break the buck, but go to like 99 rather than that's like, yeah, that that's my like. And, and so I say this without knowing like exactly what their commercial paper is like, this is sort of like that. That's a twist on it, which I'm just sort of inferring the details of that last piece based on like all the other interactions that sort of we've had with them. Okay. All right. So, so the picture that we're getting is that um, maybe not all the assets that Tether has are dollars per se. Some of these are like, dollar-like assets, which he characterizes as commercial paper. Um, so let's talk about what commercial paper actually is. Okay, so commercial paper um, are loans that you issue to uh, corporate borrowers, typically banks, and the banks uh, promise to repay them within a short amount of period. So commercial paper is... Um, uh, it can be secured or unsecured, um, but uh, typically it's it's just pretty senior on the cap table. So if the if the bank does go default, uh, commercial paper is is relatively safe. However, 
uh, you are taking on the credit risk of that bank to pay you back within a certain period of time. So uh, let's look at how much commercial paper actually yields. So uh, here is um, the three-month AAA commercial CP rate, commercial paper rate. Uh, so, th so basically, over the past few years, um, you know, it's basically starting with 2019 and 2022, uh, it was actually very low because this was COVID, uh, and you know, the Fed cut rates down to zero. So in this time, if you actually invested in AA three-month commercial paper you would have made only an average of you know, less than 1% over this time period. Now it's getting higher because rates are climbing, but it was very low for basically the, 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 the entire history of the time where Tether was actually deploying uh, and earning yield. They could be putting it all into Bitcoin, but that would just be sort of a strange move on their part because, like, they they have like a good business putting it into commercial. Exactly, Bitcoin. like they've got lots of legitimate, profitable, good businesses. They don't need to do that. Also, it's unclear why they would do that. Like, it's sort of like incredibly risky. And any of the other things, like you get to know the people involved I'm here. They're not like that. they really, really aren't scammers. Like, like, it's really not like you come away dealing with them. You're like, they're selling me snake oil, and like they're just blatantly lying about everything, and like. I'm pretty sure that like nothing is like that's not at all sort of like the interactions that, that people have with them. Did you? Okay. So um, let me just point out one thing, which is when someone tells you that, you know, that other person is definitely legit. Um, that person is definitely not a known scammer. Um, trust me. They're, 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 they're awesome. They're good people. If the person telling you that actually turns out to be the biggest scammer in history, um, it puts everything he said before in a different light. And I would argue that the more that he vouches for Tether, the less I trust them. Did you watch the CNBC interview? Yeah, there, uh, is, is that the one with, uh, um, with the legal counsel? Yeah. Yeah, I think they back themselves into a lot of positions where like, they, they, they sort of like make probably basically correct claims, but ones in which they're not going to, as you said, like they don't feel comfortable elaborating maybe for like, just sort of like, uh, you know, ethical reasons, maybe because like the truth is like a little bit messier. They don't feel comfortable disclosing for ethical reasons because the truth is messy. Hmm. Yeah. This might be an unfair question, but I'd be interested in your answer. Like, if if the worst of the conspiracy theories were true about Tether, like, I don't know, say it's investing, it's investing in commercial paper, but it's investing in like Chinese commercial paper and Evergrande commercial paper. Yeah, exactly. And it all goes like bottom up. Which Given that, uh, you know, Bifinex is based in Hong Kong, uh, and, uh, you know, um, it's clearly much closer to China than it is to U.S. And the Evergrande is probably one of the biggest borrowers in China. Um, I would not be surprised if Evergrande is actually what uh, Tether's investing into. Which, which is a rumor that's out there, of course. Um, and Tether collapses. What would that mean for Bitcoin and the wider crypto space? Yeah. So I'm, do you want me to take like the fantastical version of that where Tether goes to zero or do you want me to try and take like what I think is sort of the most proximate, like vaguely plausible version of it? How about both? Can you do both? Yeah, let's do both. <laughs> so maybe first I'll talk about the sort of plausible version. So like what if they took a third of the money that they had and put it in like sort of B tier commercial paper from China, like B tier for China commercial paper? Okay. And and then, you know, there's sort of a run on the bank in China as looks like, you know, whatever that, that could happen. Um, and uh, and it turns out that, like, this B-tier commercial paper, like, 40% defaulted on average or something. And so you ended up with, like, you know, a 12% loss of the tethered treasury, right? You know, the 40% of 30% or something like that. Like, let's say that's where you ended up, which I think is, like, you know, 
a sort of like very negative, but like not completely implausible outcome. What happens then? So Tether is sort of in some some mystical sense is worth 88 cents or well, it's worth at least 88 cents, right? Okay. So, so before we move on to how he describes, you know, this situation pan out, let me just clarify uh, what he's saying here. So um, the, um, uh, they're asking him to describe a scenario, you know, whether whether tether might blow up. So he's talking about a more plausible uh, scenario here, which is one where tether's portfolio consists of maybe two thirds dollars and one third, um, you know, kind of commercial paper to B grade borrowers. Okay, so who are these B grade borrowers? He's assuming that these B grade borrowers have a default rate of forty percent. Um, so, so forty percent is an extremely high default rate. Uh, in terms of ratings, that would probably be like a something like a, a single B or even lower in terms of rating. Um, so, so when he says B grade, he literally means single B rated <laughs> borrowers at forty percent. And the assumption here is that the forty percent uh, borrowers default. And you're getting twelve. You're getting forty. Sorry, you're getting a th- the third of the borrowers default. Uh, a third of the portfolio defaults. You get forty percent recovery, and therefore your total loss is twelve percent on a portfolio of one hundred, and you're getting eighty-eight cents back on the dollar. Okay, let's uh, let's move on and describe. See how he describes this scenario playing out if there's a liquidation scenario. Like you can redeem it sort of maybe for 88 cents. You know, what's the loss? The loss here is like 10 billion or something. One possibility, obviously, is like nothing happens, right? Like unless people try to redeem almost all the tether in existence, like they could keep processing. Maybe it doesn't even comes out. Maybe it comes out and for whatever reason, the crypto ecosystem doesn't seem to care. Um, That is like, I think, a plausible answer, right? It's just like weirdly things continue on as if that didn't happen. Um, but also maybe there's a little bit of a run on Tether. Um, the, the, their banking partners start to get nervous. Redeeming it becomes very difficult. Maybe they don't give you a dollar on the dollar for redemptions. Maybe they limit them. They say, look, the world can only redeem $1 billion per week total of Tether maximum. And the world wants to redeem $15 billion. And so there's like a race to redeem your Tethers and most people are not getting filled on those redemptions. Tether crashes down to, you know, 85 cents on the dollar in markets. You know, there is a lot of people who are stockpiling Tether have losses of, you know, 15%. And then I think sort of like, you know, there's some regulatory crackdowns on stable coins. And things mostly continue on as they were before, except that like, you know, $10 billion total was lost between Tether holders. Um, maybe. Okay. All right. All right. Let's, let's get into a lot more detail and really, really think about the scenario that he's painting here. So um, we have a situation where, let's say um, a third of Tether's portfolio um, defaults and the recovery is, a, is assumed 40%. So um, <laughs> first of all, um, you don't know that you're going to get 40 cents back in the dollar. And if you do any, any liquidation scenario, um, if a bar defaults, um, they are, all of their debts are frozen and the liquidation process recovery process takes years. So, um, in a scenario where two thirds of tethers are fine, one third is blown up. And if that if that fact is public, okay, um, like there will be much more than a, you know, kind of like a ten to fifteen percent loss on tether. The reason is because when the market knows that that's true, if the market knows there's a hole, everyone rushes to get their money out, and the more that tether, you know. Gates withdrawals, the more that they try to use regulations to, um, you know, forestall uh, losses by depositors, the more that will actually exacerbate the problem. Because the way the bank run works is that the more, the more, 
the more transparency you have about what's going on, and the more the market realizes that there's a problem, the more um, it's going to expose. Uh, the only, in my opinion, uh, if there was a hole like this, um, the the only way that it would not have gotten exposed is if um, you had a never-ending bull market. Because when the market when the music stops, that hole will eventually come to light. So um, the scenario that he just painted of this kind of this small bank run where the market realizes something's wrong, there's a rush on the bank, but somehow it stopped uh, with only 10 to 15% losses and socialization of the rest of the losses. Um, I think that is... That may have happened before in crypto, uh, but uh, I think it's very unwise to count on that happening all the time. Uh, and and also, I should just point out, um, and, and the most damning thing of all is that the scenario that he just described is exactly what happened to FTX. They thought that they had some asset that was on paper worth more than their liabilities, but in a liquidation scenario, that paper asset, you know, because it's based on future cash flows, which may not be realized, it's illiquid. Um, that the value of that goes down substantially and goes down a lot faster than people think. So is there a hole at Tether? Uh, is there an issue that the market uh, kind of needs to know about uh, and, and figure out? Well, I can't say for sure, but I think we can get some uh, clues if we look at some of the public statements that Tether has made. So, um, so Patrick has a good summary on his blog here of kind of like what happened with Tether. But um, in a recap, it was started by an exchange called Bitfinex. Uh, Bitfinex was hacked in 2016, and um, and so and they also had some some issues with the currency processor named Crypto Capital that turned out to be a scam. So th th there was definitely a period of time when Tether was not fully backed one to one uh, because of this, and this is known because some of the disclosures have come out, the affidavits have actually said this. So. Um, I wanted to actually zoom in on one affidavit that uh, a lawyer from Tether gave in April 2019. So uh, it's here. And um, and so uh, what, what the lawyer said was that as of April 29th, 2019, uh, Tether had cash uh, and cash equivalents of about 2.1 billion. That represents 74% of outstanding tether, and and so the um, the other twenty six percent is is assumed to be something else that is not cash in in cash equivalents. So what is that something else? Um, the market, I guess, you know, according to Sam, this is basically commercial paper um, of you know high quality borrowers and. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and so, and that's why the other 20, 26%, I guess, is good. So let's see if we can figure out what, let's just, let's, A, let's assume that this 20, 74% here is actually rock solid. And let's try to figure out what could be in the composition of the remaining 26%. So number one, I would posit that there was a hole at this point because um, this is after the Bitfinex hack. This is after they had issued this token called Leo. The, the, you know, so, so I think all the actions around this time kind of like point to the fact that you know, there was not, um, th there was, the, 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 was, was, the, the was backing Tether was not 100% cash and cash from assets. And the other stuff was uh, kind of like illiquid. So my assumption here, honestly, is that the other 26 percent uh, was basically illiquid stuff, which a lot of, a lot of which may actually be the socialization of losses from the 
the hacks. So some of that might be just Leo uh, in terms of uh, collateral. So, but, but I think what the market has, has assumed is that over the past few years, they may, there may have been a hole back in 2019, but because the market has gone up so much in the past three years, uh, that this, this hole has been papered over. So um, as a trader, I think that's actually a fairly, um, a fairly hard thing to do because let's assume that um, all 26% of what they were holding here was risky assets. The 74% were safe assets, uh, and that um, they've they've basically papered over that hole, which would have been about 0, 500 million in the intervening uh, few years. So um, to me, I think that is, while that's possible, um, the, they would have to be a pretty good trader because I would not look at the, the total dollar amount, like, hey, there's, there's 2.1 billion here, it's gone up to uh, you know, 82 billion, therefore it must have been easier for them to make up any losses. And, and the reason is because um, you still have to make a return on your assets. And so my assumption would be, if you have to essentially, they would actually have to you know, earn something like two or 3% excess yield above what they could go get otherwise in like you know in short term cash and cash equivalents in order to make up this hole over that period. So, and, and so that's why that's why my guess is if they're going to invest this twenty six percent, this twenty six percent was probably in fairly risky stuff. I don't think it was in kind of like the kind of commercial paper that um, SBF kind of like gave the impression of, and here's why. If you look at the commercial paper rates, um, this is the three-month commercial paper rate. So it was, you know, something like 1.4% in, in 2018. It was about two and a half percent in 2019. It fell when COVID happens, when rates declined, and now it's climbing back up. But look at the three-month rate for Treasuries. Treasuries is is almost identical. So. You know, if you're buying really high quality commercial paper, you're not getting much of a pickup at all over treasuries. Um, it's something like less than 1%. Uh, you know, and, and back then, when, when times are good, the, the spread between high quality CP and treasuries was probably, uh, you know, in this period, something like, you know, five basis points. So, in my opinion, there's no way that the 26% that's not cash and cash equivalents are high quality commercial paper, like what we, you know, what, what, what we, what we have here in the U S and the reason is because there's no free lunch in finance. If there's a hole and if they were going to make up that hole in the last few years by investing in stuff, that stuff must have been risky stuff. Uh, if it was liquid, you know, safe, double A, uh, you know, commercial paper, uh, A, they, they would not have made up the hole, and B, it almost doesn't even make sense to invest in it in the first place. You might as well just invest in treasuries and be able to say that, you know, your your assets are are all, all you know, all, in all, all, all there. Um, the reason why you would need to, you know, kind of stretch is because there's a hole and you're trying to make up that difference. And so the real question we should be asking is, do we think, um, if we, if we know that there was a hole back then, and if we know that they probably were not investing in something that looked like, like this, and instead the other 26% were riskier stuff, um, a, do we think that that riskier stuff paid off? So um, the, the final red flag that I see uh, is came from this article, which talks about links between Tether and Celsius. In particular, it talks about this on-chain transfer here, uh, where this wallet has transferred over a billion in USTT 
2 Celsius. And it turns out that Tether um, led the equity round for Celsius in 2020. So it's pretty likely that this is one way that Tether was earning yield. So that 26% other bucket, it's a good chance that they were uh, sending a lot of money to Celsius to try to earn extra yield. So we know that at least some of that is locked up in the Celsius liquidation. So then the question becomes, did they do better uh, with the other loans that they made? And were they actually able to paper over uh, that hole? So let's try to summarize what we know so far. Um, we know that as of April 2019, there was some type of hole left over from the Bifinex and the crypto uh, capital hacks. Uh, so at that point, Tether had 74% cash, 26% other. And um, we know that during that intervening time period, they sent a billion dollars of dollars to Celsius. Uh, so it's the Celsius loan is probably part of that other bucket. And we also know that right now, um, you know, and, and we also know that during that period, they've they've basically had Sam Bankman Freed, uh, you know, from, from Alameda Research, one of the closest partners out there, basically saying how robust and how much how how much conviction uh, he has in 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 Tether um, to all the all the top U.S. media outlets. And finally, we know that right now um, we don't know uh, what Tether's assets are because they have not disclosed it. So um, from all that, um, I think we are left to infer whether or not Celsius as a whole. So right now, um, I don't know, uh, but here's what I do know, which is um, an axiom I've learned from, from 2008 uh, during the financial crisis, which is, um, you know, when a firm uh, is trying to prove that they're solvent, uh, it's to their advantage to be transparent. If a firm is insolvent, it's to their advantage to be opaque. Therefore, you can infer a firm's solvency status from what they're saying publicly.